Corra, he can share the Yanda Coro, Yanda Rada Corro, Yanda Mata. I come to you with love. I come to you with precious, holy love. Receive me. I am your God. I love you. I love you. From everlasting to everlasting, I love you. Holy love, pure love, undefiled by man. I love you. I am your creator. I am your God. I am the everlasting one. I am the holy one of Israel. I am the God who sees you. I am the God who loves you and created you just as you are for my purpose. Respond. We just respond to you, Lord, and we say yes. Thank you, Lord, for your love. Thank you for your love. Your love and kindness. Oh, thank you for your faithfulness, God. Oh, thank you, Lord. If you're here today and, and you've never heard of this love, this is the love of God. The scripture tells us, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I like the verse right after it, because it says, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that through Him the world might be saved. Today, amen, yes. Today, know this, God is not against you, but He is for you. And He loves you so much that He gave His priceless Son to come and to die, to live a perfect life and die on a cross. But we know that He didn't stay there, right? Three days later, He rose again from the grave. And he ascended in, into heaven not too long after that. And the scripture tells us that he's in heaven today interceding for you and I. That means that he is in heaven praying for you and I. So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, but you'd say, yeah, I want to know Jesus. I want to make him my Savior. It's real simple. All you and I have to do is just say yes. And so I'd like to lead you in a prayer today, if that'd be all right. And everybody just pray with me. And if you're here today, and you'd say, you'd say yeah, I want to pray that prayer, then just, just repeat after me today. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, I say yes. I hear you calling. And I say yes. I accept your Son as my Savior. I believe that he died on the cross for my sins and he rose again and he ascended into heaven and today I confess my need of a savior in my life Lord will you come in will you forgive me of my sins will you give me a new start we give me a new beginning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Just wait. Four of the five Sundays in the month of March, I'm doing a series. Two weeks from today, Stephanie and I are so excited to have two of our favorite people in the world come and do ministry on that day. They are part of uh, an organization called Mercy Ships. And if you've never heard of it, it is incredible. But um, Bob and Sherilyn Cook will be with us here and I love them. He is a dynamic speaker. He is just full energy. His, his volume is about 20 decibels above mine. So just heads up to the sound crew. I mean, I, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have Bob's voice, okay? But... Um, he, he was the district superintendent in Rocky Mountain District for, uh, I think, about a decade and then actually served for our fellowship as the 
the national leader for um, higher education in the Assemblies of God. Uh, he's an educated guy, but he's a down-to-earth guy. He just loves people. And right now at this stage in their life, they are loving serving people with needs on mercy ships. So if, if you have not heard of that, you've got to be there that day. I really want to say a huge thank you to Paulette and to Pastor Mo, who just the last two Sundays preached and did an amazing job. Can we say thank you? And there are more people slated for the remainder of the year so that you don't have to just listen to me all the time. And if you're excited about that, say amen, but not too loud, okay? All right, but anyways, um, I'm, I'm sharing this Sunday, next Sunday, and then on the 22nd and the 29th, this series of messages called Ashes to Lashes. And here's what it's all about. Um, this past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday. Some of you may have never heard of that. What is that? Well, it primarily is a Catholic, Catholic observation. By the way, we're not Catholic, capital C, but we are Catholic, little c. Amen. So if you don't know what I meant by that, the word Catholic means universal. Yes. Catholic church means universal church. We believe... There is one church Amen. in Jesus Christ. If you have faith in Him, if you follow Him, and if you're in relationship with Him. I know many Catholics who are in wonderful relationship with Jesus Christ. And then I know many who sadly are not, who have not heard, who did not know that we can walk in relationship with Jesus Christ. So um, Ash Wednesday kicks off a season 40 days up until Good Friday uh, called Lent. And um, what that's all about, it's, it's not something that we observe, but over recent years, Pentecostal churches and evangelical churches in general in the last 10 years have said, wow, what a good idea. What Lent is all about, it begins on Wednesday, this past Wednesday, and all of the 40 days, excluding certain days on uh, Sundays, for instance, the Lord's Sabbath, <coughs> the church Sabbath, that's not really a true term, but excluding those days. But the 40 days leading up to, to Good Friday, you use it to search your soul. You, you, a lot of times people will fast and pray. Sometimes they will give up something. And we sort of did that in January, didn't we? Uh, first 21 days of the new year, we, we did the Daniel fast, and I encouraged all of us to seek after the Lord. So I'm not asking you to necessarily do that, but I think it's a wonderful idea anytime we present ourselves to the Lord and say, I just would simply like you to search me and, and know me and better it helped me to know you better and if there's anything in here that needs to change please change it do your work on me i think that's a positive thing so ashes to lashes well it starts with ash wednesday you may have seen it's a, a catholic and and um uh, episcopalian and some of the high church protestant churches will dip their finger in ashes uh, or the priest can write the cross with ash on their forehead. And it's a sign of being marked over these next 40 days. Um, that's the ashes part. Lashes, what's that about? Lashes is that Jesus received lashes on His back on Good Friday. He was crucified. He died for us. I'm wondering, what is that 40-day period like? Ashes to lashes from Jesus' viewpoint. I'm, I'm wondering... Wouldn't it be interesting to study some key events that happened, and that's what we're doing during these four Sunday mornings. What was it like from Jesus' perspective 40 days leading up to Good Friday? And then, if the Lord allows, I'm planning after that, after the Easter resurrection, to talk about the 40 days and in fact add 10 more to the 40 days of appearances, appearances and then 10 days later he pours out his Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost. I, I want us to focus that direction just as a church as we're going through these next several weeks. And so uh, the sermon today is called Lent Me Your Ears. And it's from that famous speech, lend me your ears, but I don't know, I, I love to play on words. I think that people sometimes will go, 
Um, what is he up to? But at least maybe you'll remember it, right? Lent, not Lent, but Lent me your ears. And I'm going to read a portion of scripture from Mark chapter 7. And this is, um, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, this is a, a portion of scripture that makes you sort of go, wow, wait, what? What was Jesus doing? He, he did what? He, he said what? Do you ever read scripture that way? Sometimes I do. I, I'm reading scripture and I go, did I just read that right? <laughs> go back and look at it again. Let's read a portion of scripture that should make you ask just what is going on. It's Mark 7. It's the time when Jesus heals a deaf and mute man. And it reads this way. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. That's, that word is two words put together. It's a compound. Deca, ten. Sounds like decade. Ten. Polis is the word for city. Uh, we get our word police from polis. Decapolis. Deca Decapolis was the ten cities area. It's a, a big, prominent area where a lot of gatherings happen. And, and so Jesus left Tyre and Sidon, and he goes down to the Sea of Galilee, into the region of Decapolis, and there some people brought to him a man who was deaf, who could hardly talk. The man is deaf, and he can hardly talk. And they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside away from the crowd, and I'm sort of glad that he did this away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers in the man's ears. What? And get this, then he spit <laughs> and touched the man's tongue. Okay, how many of you would like to come up for prayer right now? <laughs> and then he looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh he said to him, Epitha! Which means, be opened. Just a, a little instruction when we are praying for the sick. This is my conviction, but it is an informed opinion having been in ministry three decades. I believe it's the wrong approach to beg and plead for healing. I don't think that we say, oh please, oh Lord, please, if you would be kind, just, just would you have mercy, please let healing happen. Rather, I believe that we are to administer healing. In the name of Jesus, be healed. And now, that God is a mystery. There, there's a mysterious side to Him. You can think you've got figure, God figured out, but if you ever get God figured out, then He ceases to be God. So, sometimes, in fact, I've seen many times He does the healing. And then other times, the healing doesn't seem to come. But for our part, we are to speak in faith boldly and administer healing and believe that it's going to happen. Amen. And that's what Jesus does here. Jesus doesn't negotiate with this sickness. He just says, ears, mouth, be opened. And they were open. At this, the man's ears were open. His tongue was loosened and he began to speak plainly. Wow. Now, I, I'm a little bit different maybe than some people as I'm reading Scripture. I'm always trying to put myself in the story. And I, I picture what must it have been like to be this man. Can't hear. Um, he can't, can't even speak. He's, he's, he's got a speech impediment. He, he, they're, wanting, they're asking him with signs. You want Jesus to touch you? He's, he's healing people. He's opening ears. He's, he's opening mouths. But blind people are seeing. I don't know what sign language de was developed at this point. I don't know just exactly how it works. But they lead this man who can't hear. And he can't speak to Jesus. And, and he's watching Jesus. As Jesus takes his fingers and puts them right in his ears. Now that's a little weird, but he's going, okay... I understand because I, I am deaf. 
And Jesus then spits, I presume, in his hands and touches his tongue and and the, the man who was who was deaf and the man who he has been uh, mute, I'll bet you, because the Bible doesn't record his first words, but I'll bet you it went something like this. What did you just, you, you mean you just tell, wait, wait, I can talk? <laughs> you just spit and touch my, thank you. <laughs> I think. What? Wait, I'm hearing my own voice. I, I can hear now. But, oh no, you didn't. I think there's something going on really amazing. Jesus, um, in fact, one person I researched said that Jesus never healed any two people the same method, the same way. I don't know if that's true. I didn't get time to study that out, but I was intrigued by that comment. But I began to think, yeah, he did use a lot of different methods, a lot of different approaches. Um, he was never going to be reduced to a formula. He was always going to be mysterious. But there are some things about him, like this. Poke in the ear. <clears throat> spit on the tongue. Now just stop right there for just a moment. I did a lot of reading about this because I, I was fascinated by it. Because honestly, I'm the kind that when, when I see flamboyant kinds of things and you know people rolling up their sleeves and taking off their watch and putting the coat down and getting ready to really pray over people, I kind of, I don't mean to be judgmental, but I sort of go, I'm, I'm not sure. I think because I, I, in fact, when I pray over people, I never get that forced like that I'm trying to push them down or something. In fact, I touch people so gently because I never want it to appear that I'm manipulating something. Does that make sense? And I, and I think a lot of you can relate to that. And uh, I was just reading about a church down in Florida um, that is really. Uh, there's some indictments against the church because the founding pastor's husband and wife for years have manipulated people, controlled people, told them who to divorce, who to marry, um, have cast demons out of people, there's demons of not giving enough money, demons of you know lust and demons of greed. And, and uh, at first they would lay hands on people, then they got forceful, but over three decades of ministry, it's gotten to the point where now they're doubling up their fist and knocking the demons out of people. Yeah. And they're being sued. And by the way, how many of you want to come forward for prayer? No, I'm sure. I'm sure. I, I don't mean to make light of it, I'm just saying that I'm a little bit standoffish, and I think a lot of us are when things like that happen. And so we try to explain it. And Jesus was spitting in his hands and touching the man's tongue. He poked his fingers in his ears. And there's lots of different theories out there. Um, I read one individual that had researched it and said, it's foreign to us as Americans, but in that culture, it, uh, human spittle was thought to have redemptive value and, and medicinal purposes. And, um, and it, it is true that there were some strange things that occurred, but none of it happened during Jesus' time. After Jesus died and rose from the dead, went back to the Father, then later on, the next hundred years, couple of hundred years later even, uh, Pliny records historical accounts of people praying for others and putting spit on them, but they didn't do it the way Jesus did. Like for instance, if the person had something wrong with their eyes, they would spit on their hands and touch their bosom for some reason. I don't know why. And if the person had an ailment in their back or their shoulders, then they would spit on their hands and touch their knees. And I'm kind of thinking, well, you're, you know, you're laying hands in the wrong spot. I don't know what the purpose was. But, but at the time of Jesus, that was not the case. When Jesus walked on the earth to spit publicly was just like now. It was frowned upon. It was looked down upon. It was thought as, of, as distasteful and, and sort of um, very, well, obviously very disrespectful. If you go back to the Old Testament times, 
If, if a brother had married a woman and they did not have children together, and then he, that, that man died, his brother was to step in and marry his widowed sister-in-law. That's weird. But that's Old Covenant. But, but if, if the man refused to do that, then everybody in the town would gather around and they'd put him in the center of the town and they'd spit on him. And it was a way of saying, you lowlife, how dare you not allow the Jewish line to continue with your selfishness. Or there were other instances where a leper um, was pronounced unclean and and sometimes if he would walk into the community, he was required to say, give space, I'm a leper, I'm unclean, unclean. And there were instances where people would spit upon the leper, the same leper that Jesus went to and embraced. Yeah. Right? Right. Amen. So, but so when Jesus does this, though, it wasn't as if he was using a, a common medical practice. This was something pretty, pretty disgusting. And it makes you think, why in the world would he do that? If you were to go to the next chapter, I won't put the scripture on the screen, but I'll just remind you of it. There's another case where Jesus spits on someone. In fact, it happened three times. Do you remember them? One we just read about. Uh, there was another one who was, it's a, a man was born blind and Jesus takes dirt and spits in it and makes mud and puts it on the man's eyes and suddenly he can see. And I have always felt like that that was a reference back to this is how we did it at creation. Me and my, me and my father, we scooped up some dirt and breathed life into it. I've got very reputable um, Bible scholar friends who said that's ridiculous. There's no basis in it. But I noticed that immediately after it, the response was, we haven't seen this since the creation. So I believe that Jesus was saying, here's what I did when I created the world, and I'm about to just create some new eyesight for you. But there was a third incident, and it's in the next chapter, Mark chapter 8. It's a man who is blind. And in this instance, Jesus doesn't spit in his hands, but rather he spits spits on the man's face. How many of you want to come for prayer? <laughs> and, and the man, the man is, um, uh, can you imagine that? What are you doing? What? Wait, I, I, can, I can see you. Wow. Thank you. I mean, I think. Can you imagine what it must have been like to be him? And so, if you've got the poke in the ear, the spit on the tongue, and I put and in the eye. But here's, here's the third thing that doesn't show up in the text, but I believe it's really what it's all about. It's a slap on the face. You see, because you can read this scripture from every angle. Chapter 7 and chapter 8 of Mark. What happened with the man who was blind, Jesus heals him, but he doesn't do it immediately. Do you remember the story? He says, now, can you see? And he says, yes, I, I see, but the men all appear as trees walking around. In other words, it's blurry. I, I can't quite make it out. Then he lays hands on him and prays over him, and now he can see fully. Why is that story even there? Because... Jesus had just told his disciples, Peter, you're right. I am the Son of God. Flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. And then it says, immediately, immediately he began to tell them, I am going to die on the cross. They're going to crucify the Son of Man. They didn't get it. They didn't receive it. They're, they're headed towards Jerusalem. And Jesus is saying, you guys don't quite have the picture of how this is going to work. 
And they're thinking, yeah, yeah, Jesus, but we're following you. And when, by the way, when we get to Jerusalem, Jesus gets the big chair, but I get the assistant big chair. We all understand, he's number one, right? But when he overthrows Rome, don't any of you guys try to steal my place because I'm the assistant to the main man. And they're jockeying for position. And they don't understand what's going to be required of them. They don't understand that they're going to watch the man that has taught them for three years be crucified on a cross. How insulting. How disrespectful. It's a slap in the face to anything that's decent. It's like spitting in the eye or touching the tongue with spit or, or sticking your fingers, poking them in someone's ears. It's it's just, it's, it's disrespectful. And I'm going to tell you, here's what I want to submit to you, that Jesus, at some point in your walk with Him, will absolutely put His fingers in your ear. He will spit upon your tongue. He will slap your face. And He will see if your commitment is genuine or not. Amen. It's not the way you wanted it. Wait a minute, Jesus. This is what I drew up. I've had two slaps, actually. I hope two's enough. I, Lord, I hope two are enough. 1999 and 2015. I'll bet you have had a 1999 and a 2015. I'll bet you have. Maybe it was a different year for you. Uh, maybe it was totally different sets of circumstances. But my family has had two defining moments where we stretched our hands to heaven and said, God, I don't understand. But I am trusting you. Yes, I will follow you yes. no matter what. Yes. Felt so insulted. Felt like a slap in the face. What is going on, God? But for God to take that misery and bring beauty, Praise. I wouldn't exchange anything Praise. for it. I was thinking as, as Pastor Mo was leading the song, Lord, I'm amazed by you. The story that I heard from our older brother, Jamie, he was at a worship conference with the writer of this song, Jared. They both had little boys at the time. Now Ethan is a freshman in high school. How does time, how does that happen? But they, they both had little active boys that were scrambling and both of them decided we're going to let Mom stay in and enjoy the conference and they made their way out to the lobby to sort of corral them. Didn't know one another, but sat there on the bench and talked and, oh wait, aren't you the one who wrote such and such? And Jared told him the story of how this little boy that he was holding, what an answer to prayer. How that song, Lord, I'm amazed by you, came out of the tragedy that they had experienced over the months leading up to that conference. And now it blesses people around the world. So here's the takeaway today. Don't be afraid to let Jesus get in your face. Amen. Jesus wants to get up close to you. He doesn't want to know you from a distance. He, he truly, he, he wants to be right up there eye to eye. He, he doesn't want you serving Him from, from a, a cold, stale, formal place. If you're going to be close to Jesus, then you run the risk that at some point He's going to get in your face. He's going to invade your space. Jesus will not respect your Praise bubble. But He has to do that because He knows what we need. Only He can know it. And so I encourage you to let Jesus in. I want to ask the worship team to come back and and as they're coming, I just wanted to tell you, um, we had planned to receive communion this morning, but I did not plan very well. I didn't realize we were so low on supplies. And so um, we need to reorder and we'll do it. Possibly even next Sunday we'll have communion. But I look forward to communion. But I wonder if, if our communion could today could be that we present our very selves to Him. 
You know, the bread that we would eat, that is His body that was broken for us. The, the cup that we drink, that is His blood that was spilled for us. What a, what a slap in the face it was for the beautiful Son of God to be strung up and hung on a cross with crowns piercing His brow and blood dropping down. His, his flesh on His back absolutely just ripped to shreds. What a slap in the face. But He did that out of love. So if you find yourself in a, a moment right now where you think, man, where is God in all of this? If you feel like, Lord, are you even listening and do you even care? You may not even bring yourself to pray that. But just know, just know that He does. And that He is using this for His grand Father, again, we just commit our very lives to you. Thank you for the family that you've put us in. And I'm not referring to our bloodline, but I'm referring to your family, the family of God. Thank you for planting us in the family of God. The psalmist said he places them in families. You have placed us in this family. Our prayer is that you would take our lives and bring glory and honor to your name. Especially the ones that are facing difficulty right now. Oh, I pray for them, Lord. Don't let them get upset about it. But, but cause them to realize if you're facing something this serious, it could only be that God has allowed it because He loves you so much that He trusts you with it. And He will see you through. So I pray for my brothers and sisters, Lord. Some of them are going into a storm. Some are right in the middle of the storm. Some are coming out of the storm. Some are on smooth sailing and just enjoying life. Thank you for the seasons of our souls. But especially the ones that are in it right now. Oh, Father, we call them to you. We just pray that you give them strength and encouragement and uplifting. Father, give physical strength. And we just come against fatigue and tiredness. We proclaim and we pronounce physical rest for your children. Thank you, God. We speak an attentive ear. We speak attenuation in that ear to hear what the Lord is saying. Let me your ears, Jesus says. Listen to what I'm speaking and saying to you in this season. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lamb of God. We're just going to sing a little bit in worship and then we're going to go. degrading themselves about how they raise their children. False guilt, maybe how they've come out, their children have come out and are being, but you've endured this and it's stifled you over the years and it's a thought missile that the pastor was talking about that the enemy can come in and bring havoc into these mothers' lives. And But the Lord is saying this morning that He wants you to come and be free of that. If there's sin, then lay it out. But go, go with me, lay it out, 
and allow the Holy Spirit to bring new life, new thoughts about your children, to bring strength in you as a mother, bring hope as a mother, to bring life as a mother for your family. But do not leave here with that right. in your heart, in your mind. So, so precious. Thank you. I want the ladies in particular that are available up here, if, if that touched you and you want prayer for it, please come and see one of the ladies out for prayer. Thank you. Thank you.